Sitka Charlie had achieved the impossible. Other Indians might have known as much of the wisdom of the trail as he did, but he alone knew the white man's wisdom, the honor of the trail, and the law. Yet these things had not come to him in a day. The aboriginal mind is slow to generalize, and many facts, repeated often, are required to compass an understanding. Sitka Charlie, from boyhood, had been thrown continually with white men, and as a man he had elected to cast his fortunes with them, expatriating himself once and for all from his own people. Even then, respecting, almost venerating their power, and pondering over it, he had yet to divine its secret essence, the honor and the law. And it was only by the cumulative evidence of the years that he had finally come to understand being an alien, when he did know, he knew it better than the white man himself. Being an Indian, he had achieved the impossible. And of these things had been bred a certain contempt for his own people, a contempt which he had made it a habit to conceal, but which now burst forth in a polyglot whirlwind of curses upon the heads of Ka Kuchi and Gohi. They cringed before him like a pair of snarling wolf-dogs, too cowardly to spring, too wolfish to cover their fangs. They were not handsome creatures, neither was Sitka Charlie. All three were frightful-looking. There was no flesh to their faces. Their cheekbones were masked with hideous scabs, which had cracked and frozen alternately under the intense frost while their eyes burned luridly with the light which alone is born of desperation and hunger. Men so situated beyond the pale of the honor and the law were not to be trusted. Sitka Charlie knew this, and this was why he had forced them to abandon their rifles with the rest of the camp outfit ten days before. His rifle and Captain Effingwell's were the only ones that remained. Come! Get a fire started, he commanded, drawing out the precious matchbox with its attendant strips of dry birch bark. The two Indians fell sullenly to the task of gathering dead branches and underwood. They were weak, and paused often, catching themselves in the act of stooping. With giddy motions, or staggering to the center of operations, with their knees shaking like castanets. After each trip, they rested for a moment as though sick and deadly weary. At times their eyes took on the patient stoicism of dumb suffering. And again, the ego seemed almost bursting forth with its wild cry, I, I, I want to exist. The one dominant note of the whole living universe. A light breath of air blew from the south, nipping the exposed portions of their bodies and driving the frost in needles of fire through fur and flesh to the very bones. So, when the fire had grown lusty and thawed a damp circle in the snow about it, Sitka Charlie forced his reluctant comrades to lend a hand in pitching a fly. It was a primitive affair, merely a blanket, stretched parallel with the fire and to the windward of it, at an angle of perhaps forty-five degrees, this shut out the chill wind and threw the heat backward and down upon those who were huddled in its shelter. Then a layer of green spruce boughs was spread that their bodies might not come in contact with the snow. When this task was completed, Ka Chuk Ti and Go He proceeded to take care of their feet. Their ice-bound moccasins were sadly worn by much travel, and the sharp ice of the river jams had cut them to rags. Their sea-swash socks were in similar condition, and when these had been thawed and removed, the dead white tips of toes, in various stages of mortification, told their simple tale of the trail. Leaving the two to the drying of their footgear, Sitka Charlie turned back over the course he had come. He, too, had a mighty longing to sit by the fire and tend his complaining flesh, but the honor and the law forbade it. He toiled painfully over the frozen field, each step a protest, every muscle in revolt. Several times, where the open water between the jams had recently crusted, he was forced to miserably accelerate his movements as the fragile footing swayed and threatened beneath him. 
In such places, to stop was to break through. To break through was to die. To die quickly and easily. But it was not his desire to endear no more, so he hastened. His deepening anxiety vanished as two Indians dragged into view round a bend in the river. They staggered and panted like men under heavy burdens. Yet the packs on their backs were a matter of but a few pounds. He questioned them eagerly, and their replies seemed to relieve him. He hurried on. Next came two white men, supporting a woman between them. They also behaved as though drunken, and their limbs shook with weakness. But the woman leaned lightly upon them, choosing to carry herself forward with her own strength. At sight of her, a flash of joy cast its fleeting light upon Sitka Charlie's face. He cherished a very great regard for Mrs. Effingwell. He had seen many white women, but this was the first to travel the trail with him. When Captain Effingwell had proposed the hazardous undertaking and made him an offer for his services, he had shaken his head gravely, for it was an unknown journey through the dismal vastness of the Northland, and he knew it to be of the kind that tries to the uttermost the souls of men. But when he learned that the captain's wife was to accompany them, he had refused flatly to have anything further to do with it. Had it been a woman of his own race, he would have harbored no objections. But these women of the Southland, no, no, they were too soft, too tender for such enterprises. The idea was not to be entertained for an instant. Sitka Charlie did not know this kind of woman. Five minutes before, he had not even dreamed of taking charge of the expedition, but when she came to him with her wonderful smile and her straight, clean English and talked to the point, without pleading or persuading, he had incontinentally yielded. Had there been a softness and appeal in the eyes, a tremble to the voice, a taking advantage of sex, he would have stiffened to steel. Instead, her clear, searching eyes and clear, ringing voice, her utter frankness and assertion of equality, had robbed him of his reason. He felt, then, that this was a new breed of woman, and ere they had been trail mates, for many days, he knew why the sons of such women mastered the land and the sea, and why the sons of his own womankind could not prevail against them. Tender and soft, day after day he watched her, muscle-weary, exhausted, indomitable, and the words beat upon his brain in a perennial refrain, tender and soft. He knew her feet had been born to easy paths in sunny lands, strangers to the moccasined pain of the north, unkissed by the chill lips of the frost, and he watched and marveled at them, twinkling ever through the weary day. She had always a smile and a word of cheer from which not even the meanest packer was excluded. As the way grew darker, she seemed to stiffen and gather greater strength. And when Ka Kukchi and Go He, who had bragged that they knew every landmark of the way, as a child did, the skin bales of the teepee, acknowledged that they knew not where they were, it was she who raised a forgiving voice amid the curses of the men. She had sung to them that night, till they felt weariness fall from them and were ready to face the future with fresh hope. And when the food failed, and each scant stint was measured jealously, she it was who rebelled against the machinations of her husband and Sitka Charlie, and demanded and received a share neither greater nor less than that of the others. Sitka Charlie was proud to know this woman. A new richness, a greater breadth had come into his life with her presence. Hitherto he had been his own mentor, had turned to the right or left at no man's beck. He had molded himself according to his own dictates, nourished his manhood regardless of all save his own opinion. For the first time he had felt a call from without for the best that was in him. Just a glance of appreciation from the clear searching eyes, a word of thanks from the clear ringing voice, 
just a slight wreathing of the lips, in that wonderful smile, and he felt his reward to be greater than he deserved. It was a new stimulant to his manhood. For the first time he thrilled with a conscious pride in his wisdom of the trail, and between the twain they ever lifted the sinking hearts of their comrades. The faces of the two men and the woman brightened as they saw him, for after all he was the staff they leaned upon. But Sitka Charlie, rigid as was his wont, concealing pain and pleasure impartially, asked them the welfare of the rest, told the distance of the fire, and continued on the back trip. Next, he met a single Indian, unburdened, limping, lips compressed and eyes set with the pain of a foot, in which the quick fought a losing battle with the dead. All possible care had been taken of him, but in the last extremity the weak and unfortunate must perish, and Sitka Charlie deemed his days to be few. The man could not keep up for long, so he gave him rough cheering words. After that came two more Indians to whom he had allotted the task of helping along Joe, the third white man of the party. They had deserted him. Sitka Charlie saw at a glance the lurking spring in their bodies, and knew they had at last cast off his mastery. So he was not taken unawares when he ordered them back in quest of their abandoned charge, and saw the gleam of the hunting knives as they drew them from the sheaths. A pitiful spectacle, three weak men lifting their puny strength in the face of the mighty vastness. But the two recoiled under the fierce rifle blows of the one, and returned like beaten dogs to the leash. Two hours later, with Joe reeling between them, and Sitka Charlie bringing up the rear, they came to the fire, where the remainder of the expedition crouched in the shelter of the fly. A few words, my comrades, before we sleep, Sitka Charlie said, after they had devoured their slim rations of unlemoned bread. He was speaking to the Indians in their own tongue, having already given the imports to the whites. A few words, my comrades, for your own good, that perchance ye may yet live. I shall give ye the law. On his own head be the death of him that breaks it. We have passed the hills of silence, and now travel the head reaches of the Stuart. It may be one sleep, it may be several, it may be many sleeps, but in time we shall come among the men of the Yukon, who have much grub. It were well that we look to the law. Today, Ka Chukti and Gohi, whom I commanded to break trail, forgot they were men, and, like frightened children, ran away. True, they forgot. So let us forget. But hereafter let them remember. If it should happen that they do not, he touched his rifle carelessly, grimly, tomorrow they shall carry the flower, and see that the white man Joe lies not down by the trail. The cups of flour are counted. Should so much as an ounce be wanting at nightfall. Dost understand? Today there were others that forgot. Moosehead and three salmon left the white man Joe to lie in the snow. Let them forget no more. With the light of day shall they go forth and break trail. Ye have heard the law. Look well, lest ye break it. Sitka Charlie found it beyond him to keep the lines close up from Moosehead and Three Salmon, who broke trail in advance, to Ka Kukchi and Gohi and Joe, it straggled out over a mile. Each staggered, fell, or rested as he saw fit. The line of march was a progression through a series of irregular halts. Each drew upon the last remnant of his strength and stumbled onward till it was expended. But in some miraculous way, there was always another last remnant. Each time a man fell, it was with the firm belief that he would rise no more. Yet he did rise, and again and again. The flesh yielded, the will conquered. But each triumph was a tragedy. The Indian with a frozen foot, no longer erect, crawled forward on hand and knee. He rarely rested. 
for he knew the penalty exacted by the frost. Even Mrs. Effingwell's lips were at last set, and her eye, seeing, saw not. Often she stopped, pressing a mitten hand to her heart, gasping and dizzy. Joe, the white man, had passed beyond the stage of suffering. He no longer begged to be let alone, prayed to die, but was soothed and content under the adenine of delirium. ka and go dragged him on roughly, venting upon him many savage glance or blow. To them it seemed the acme of injustice. Their hearts were bitter with hate, heavy with fear. Why should they cumber their strength with his weakness? To do so meant death. To not do so, and they remembered the law of Sitka Charlie and the rifle. Joe, the white man, fell with greater frequency as the daylight waned, and so hard was he to raise that they dropped farther and farther behind. Sometimes all three pitched into the snow, so weak were they. Yet on their backs was life and strength and warmth. Within the flower sacks were all the potentialities of existence. They could not but think of this, and it was not strange that which followed. They had fallen by the side of a great timber jam where a thousand cords of firewood awaited the match. Nearby was an air hole through the ice. Kakuk Chi looked on the wood and the water, as did Gauhi. When they looked at each other, never a word was spoken. Gauhi struck a fire. Kakuk Chi filled a tin cup with water and heated it. Joe babbled of things in another land, in a tongue they did not understand. They mixed flour with the warm water till it was a thin paste, and of this they drank many cups. They did not offer any to Joe, but he did not mind. He did not mind anything, not even his moccasins, which scorched and smoked among the coals. A crystal mist of snow fell about them, softly, caressingly, wrapping them in clinging robes, and their feet would have yet trod many trails had not destiny brushed the clouds aside and cleared the air. Nay, ten minutes' delay would have been salvation. Sitka Charlie, looking back, saw the pillared smoke of their fire and guessed, and he looked ahead at those who were faithful and at Mrs. Effingwell. So, my good comrades, ye have again forgotten that ye were men. Good, very good. There will be fewer bellies to feed. Sitka Charlie retied the flower as he spoke, strapping the pack to that on his own back. He kicked Joe till the pain broke through the poor devil's bliss and brought him to his feet, doddering like a dead man. Then he shoved him out onto the trail and started on his way. The two Indians attempted to slip off. Hold, go he, and thou too, Ka Kukchi. Has the flower given such strength to thy legs that they may outrun the swift-winged lead? Think not to cheat the law, but men for the last time, and be content that ye die full-stomached. Come, step up, back to the timber, shoulder to shoulder. The two men obeyed, quietly without fear. For it is the future which presses upon the man, not the present. Thou, go he, hast a wife and children, and a deerskin lodged in the Chippewan. What is thy will in the matter? Give thou her of the goods which are mine by the word of the captain, the blankets, the beads, the tobacco, the box, which makes strange sounds after the manner of the white man. Say that I died on the trail, but say not how. And thou, Kakukchi, who hast nor wife nor child, Mine is a sister, the wife of the factor at Koshim. He beats her, and she is not happy. Give thou her the goods which are mine by the contract, and tell her that it were well she go back to her own people. Shouldst thou meet the man, and be so minded, it were a good deed that he should die. He beats her, and she is afraid. Are ye content to die by the law? We are. Then, good-bye, my comrades. May ye sit by the well-filled pot 
in warm lodges ere the day is done. As he spoke, he raised his rifle, and many echoes broke the silence. Hardly had they died away when the other rifles spoke in the distance. Sitka Charlie started. There had been more than one, yet there was but one other gun in the party. He gave one fleeting glance at the men who lay so quietly, smiled viciously at the wisdom of the trail, and hurried on to meet the men of the Yukon. <laughs>